There we go. Let's start with prayer requests. Anything or what we can pray for or about? Yes. Is he really? He didn't tell me that. I will text him. Me on Tuesday. Wow. Um, Karen Keenest is having her knee done tomorrow. Yeah. So we're getting some new parts here. Yeah. Unfortunately, new parts and old tractors don't always fit. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it's amazing they can do it at all, but yeah, yeah. Other requests? Yep. Yep, yep. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. So, and, but then just prayers that wherever they went, that they would eventually find Jesus. And Jesus would find them. They're, the, the way that they're living now is just... It's, it's not sustainable. Happy, mm -mm. And, um, yeah. It's simply not. You just can't. Yeah. I mean, you can't keep shooting holes in your boat yeah. and expect it to float. Yes. It's just yeah. kind of how reality is. Mm -hmm. Name so, yes, yes, absolutely. So, yes, other requests? Most certainly, let us pray. Lord God, we come before you with joy because we have Christ and Christ has us. We pray for those in need of your care. Uh, we think of two especially coming up with surgery for Zane, knee surgery on Tuesday, Karen, knee surgery on Monday. We pray that those surgeries will be successful in eliminating pain and that the recovery process would be smooth and that you would sustain them through that. We pray for Casey's co-workers, Cindy, who's retired now, and Chantel, who's coming back from rehab, that these uh, transitions in life may be ones where they experience your grace and mercy and they, allow, they are able to make these uh, with minimal difficulty. We lift up before you the various communities and families impacted by various shootings around our nation. And our hearts are broken by this, and it's very hard to sort out what's at the root of this. We understand ultimately the root is sin, but, but we, we struggle with those who are innocent in terms of doing nothing to, to merit uh, uh, being shot. And we, we don't understand, and communities are, are, are grieving and hurting. I pray that you would help people not only to bring compassion and love in the name of Jesus to those who are suffering, but also that you would teach us to think before we speak and to, to seek to gain a deeper appreciation for the human condition and then what humanity truly needs before we run to knee-jerk responses or reactions. We pray also uh, for our neighbors who seem to have moved. Uh, we pray that you would work in ways that are beyond our understanding to bring reform to their life and ultimately Christ into their hearts. We thank you for the opportunity we've had to worship you and to hear your word proclaimed and, and taught. And we pray that you would bless our time of study and conversation now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, before diving into, so I have two documents before you. One has the picture on it, and it says, The Diet of Worms, which we'll talk about in a minute. We'll start there. If you don't have a copy, well, I'll ask Rebecca to give you hers, probably because, because I didn't make enough. Um, but... Uh, Questions, comments on the morning service? Anything you want to visit about before we get to our diet of worms? 
Bob. Just a service note. Um, I don't know if people know how the words miraculously show up on the blog. Shannon does such a superb. She job does. She does. That together and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. just enhances. Yeah, yeah, and that's such a good observation. And, and, and for those online, Bob talked about how the words just don't magically appear upon the wall. They, they have to be put there, right? And so Shannon does that during the course of the week. And I think that's a good life lesson in general is to say, you know, like, huh, this building didn't fall out of heaven. Someone had to put it here, right? And uh, there was a lot of work that went into it. Uh, the words on the screen didn't just, just appear there. Someone had to put some work into it. And most of the time, those people are invisible. You just see my mug up there, but I didn't put the words up on the screen. I mean, I gave them to Shannon to put up there, but, but the, all the behind the scenes stuff that happens that sometimes we are not, not willfully blind, just, just don't see it. So yeah, a, a deeper appreciation for the people behind the scenes who make those things happen. Uh, there's something to give thanks for there. Yes? Well, on the same note, Annette says special thanks for the beautiful music from the chorus. Oh, yeah, thank you, Annette. Yeah, the choir did a great job. I'm so happy to have the choir singing and appreciate that you're able to hear them and participate online. So that's pretty cool. Good. Anything else? Questions, comments? Okay, so we, we have two documents we're going to get through, and um, then if we get done early, well, you can just uh, go dance outside, I guess, because we'll be done early. But anyway, the Diet of Worms or the Diet of Verms, it's just one of these great titles in history that totally, I mean, it comes into English, it does not mean that at all, <laughs> right? But I, mean, I loved, you know, everyone thinks you're eating worms. Well, no, worms is the city, which actually doesn't mean worms. I'm not sure what it means, but it doesn't mean worms. And diet means council or meeting, the meeting at the city of worms. And it involves church and state together. Church and state is not so neatly divided in this time as it is for us. So you have Emperor Charles V. He's there and Luther is there. Uh, Emperor Charles V is all of 21 years old at this time and Luther is in his upper 30s. So he's not an old man either, but compared to the emperor, he's, you know, not a full double his age, but he's getting close to double his age. And so this is a newish emperor. And this is the first time I believe he's actually been in his empire since he was uh, crowned king, uh, or not king, emperor. Um, so you have to know a little bit of history, and I don't know enough of this, just enough to be dangerous. But uh, uh, the Holy Roman Empire basically was just roughly is what we call Germany today. Germany as a country didn't exist yet. It was uh, what we might call provinces or regions. Uh, so Prussia, Saxony, um, other regions of of Germany would make up the Holy Roman Empire, and each region would have a prince who's also called an elector. That, and I forget, a dozen ish, don't quote me on that, it could be higher or lower than that. Dozen ish electors, and their job was to elect the Holy Roman Emperor, all right? And so that means they had great power because you get, you know, let's say there are 12 people voting. So the Holy Roman Emperor does care who the princes are and he needs to kind of uh, work to keep their favor. Uh, and so there's some political struggles going on, but the Holy Roman Emperor also had some say over the church. And he was interested because uh, during this time, you also have some of the Crusades happening. And I know the politically correct version of the Crusades paints the Christians as these horrible people who just wanted to storm into the Muslim land and so forth. Well, did Christians do bad things in the Crusades? Yes. You, I have a book called Sword and Scimitar, which will just give you nightmares if you read through what, what these armies did. But anyway, after hundreds of years of Muslim invaders, the Christian empire responds militarily. And you can criticize that if you want, but it was not, it was an, um, a response to hostilities. So this is all going on uh, not too far from the Holy Roman Empire, all right, because they're making their way toward Europe. And this has the emperor also concerned because he needs a unified empire to, to wield off 
these Muslim invaders. So all of this is happening while you have this huge religious reformation going on, which is dividing the empire. So he wants a unified empire, and his goal here is to come in here and deal with this Luther, because he's causing trouble. He's dividing people. Well, the Pope had just the year prior issued his big document called Exerge Domine, which was, I forget what the, what stands for. It was his, his, his document basically telling Luther, from the time you receive this letter, you have 60 days to recant, to deny your position. And so it takes a while for the mail to get there, but eventually it gets there. Luther takes his 60 days. At the end of 60 days, you know what he does with that document? He burns it publicly, uh, which didn't go so well in terms of the Pope's you know, thought about Luther. So Luther gets excommunicated, kicked out of the church. And now he's getting summoned to Worms to recant his teachings politically before the, the emperor. And Luther had hoped, he had actually implored many times, that he'd be able to come and defend himself and offer uh, um, his position and then enter into debate, but this was not going to be allowed at all. He basically was told, recant or you're an outlaw, which means the law no longer protects you, which is scary. It means anybody can kill you at will. So that's kind of what's at stake here. All right. So this is this document. All right. The Imperial Diet of Worms of 1521 was in many respects the culmination of the first phase of the Luther of the Luther's sorry, Luther's Reformation, the Lutheran's Reformation. In 1517, Luther's protest had begun with his re rejections of certain aspects of the medieval doctrine of penance and indulgences in the 95 Theses. As opposition increased and as he studied the scriptures in their original languages, Luther's departures from the late medieval theology grew even more significant. The increasing gap between Luther and the papacy, that's the Pope, the papacy would be like the office of Pope, on key questions regarding the Christian faith eventually culminated in a definitive rupture when in late 1518 or 1519, Luther came to his mature understanding of the gospel. By early 1520, with the publication of his three Reformation treatises, Freedom of a Christian, On the Babylonian Captivity of the Church, Letter to the Christian Nobility of the German Nation. These are all available online if you're curious. Just Google them. I mean, get ready to read for a while, though, because um, they didn't write like we write. I mean, they didn't hesitate to write these huge tomes. I mean, they could go on for pages and pages and pages and lots of words, right? But they didn't have social media where you had to have, keep it short, right? They, that's not how they functioned. And they were much more literate culture and a much, much less visual culture. I mean, not, not everyone can read, but you didn't have the image predominate so much like you do today, right? Okay, uh, the implications of the doctrine of justification by grace through faith have been fully digested in Luther's thought. By June 1520, the Vatican's patience had run thin. Pope Leo X published the bull, Exerge Domine, that's right, it means rise up, O Lord, which outlined 41 errors of Luther. The reformer was warned unequivocally that if he did not publicly renounce these errors and submit himself to the authority of the Roman Church, that he would be excommunicated. For those living in the 16th century, excommunication was far more serious than to simply being shunned by the institutional church. Excommunication, more often than not, carried with it the penalty of torture and death at the hands of the civil authorities. So look, uh, and it, it's no small miracle that Luther wasn't burned at the stake, all right, because about 100 years previous, another would-be reformer who had many of the similar concerns that Luther had, uh, Johannes Huss, Johann Huss, he was burned at the stake because he was considered a heretic by the Pope, and they burned him at the stake. I mean, that was the price of heresy. They would tie you up and burn you to death. Whoa! So I think you want to think twice before messing with the Pope, right? Because that was the message. Get in line or we kill you. So excommunication wasn't just, well, you can't have communion. It was, um, we're going to tie you up and burn you. So big deal, right? So it's, it's no, um, the, don't miss the symbolism of what Luther does. He's, he's fearing being burned at the stake. And what does he do? He burns the, the papal document. 
yeah, you're going to burn me, I'm burning this. Right? So the symbolism there is powerful and probably a little bit in your face, which is which Luther was known for. But to be fair, that's par for the course in this culture. We're a very nice culture and we don't want to upset anybody. They didn't have that concern. <laughs> so um, if you ever read the Book of Concord, which is the Lutheran Book of Confessions, you will find actually some choice words in that document um, for the teaching of Rome. And it might make you blush. Just be aware. Yes? And that points out one of the reasons he's reacting so strongly Luther is, is against that idea that you cannot buy your way to heaven or pray to get a person out of purgatory. Right, exactly. Good point, Annette. Absolutely. He's reacting very strongly. I mean, this was the spark that ignited the Reformation, but that's that whole indulgence thing, right, which was you buy this piece of paper which says you basically shorten your period in purgatory or you can actually buy the plenary indulgence and skip it all together or buy somebody else out of purgatory because you're buying the, the tre from the treasury of the merits, which the Bible never talks about, and applying it to this person's account and getting rid of the, the penance or the penalty that they were supposed to do to make up for their sins. It's a big piece of paper, but there's nothing in Scripture that actually teaches this. And that got Luther a little worked up, right? Because uh, it was distracting them ultimately from Jesus Christ. Okay, uh, next paragraph. Instead of submitting to the Pope's bull, Luther publicly burned it, along with a copy of the Code of Canon Law. Okay, Canon Law would be... How to put this? For, they still have Canon Law today. This would basically be the, the code that the church adopts for its governance, okay? Uh, and a lot of theological statements are in there as well, and they are to be obeyed. Let's put it that way. Uh, they have their canon law. Because you have lawyers in the church. I mean, think about that, right? It's just so foreign to us today, but you have lawyers in the church who are experts on canon law. Yes? I get just but what does Paul... Oh, yeah, so... You know, not what it means in our culture, <laughs> right? The, the bull would be an official document of, of the Pope, right? Uh, but Luther did kind of treat it like we treat it. Uh, it was a bunch of bull, right? <laughs> yes. It's interesting how that uh, kind of, that can be a play on words today, but it certainly didn't mean anything like that then. It was an official edict of the Pope. But good question. Uh, so he didn't actually burn the Pope's four-legged bull, right? And he didn't, that wasn't an animal involved. It was a document. Okay. He told his followers, who had gathered to observe this event, that in condemning his teaching, the Pope had condemned the gospel itself. In this, the pontiff, that's another word for Pope, had revealed himself to, in fact, be the occupant office of the Antichrist predicted by the New Testament. I'm telling you, they had some choice words to say, because Luther saw that when you add your works to the gospel, you are stealing Christ's glory from him. You are putting something between people and Christ. And that's exactly as Luther understood it and many, many others understand it, the thing that the Antichrist does. It sets something between Jesus and people. So, they had no bones about calling the Pope, or more specifically, the office of the papacy, the Antichrist. Yeah. I'm telling you, they did not fight nice, okay? These are the kind of things they're throwing around, all right? And, and um, oh, I'll tell you a quick story because you'll find this amusing. Uh, because somehow it's connected in my head. But anyway, um, so we have this little tradition in our house, our kids have instruments and they have names for them, right? I don't know if you have a name for your trumpet or not, Camden, but you need to have a name for your trumpet, all right? So, <laughs> so um, they have different names for them. And Josiah's trumpet's named Louis, which has nothing to do with what I'm talking about, just so they have names. Nathaniel's first trombone, which was my trombone from when I was in high school, I nicknamed it Luther, right? But then he got a second trombone, a nicer one, like a one that actually a person who can play the horn would have, not like what I had because I couldn't play it. So anyway, um, in, in music, uh, in instruments, they have these strange names for, the, 
my goodness, you don't even want to know all the names. But the size of the bell is called the bore. Is that the bell? It's the, what's the bore? The, part, the, you know, the lead pipe leading up to it. It's like one of the pipes leading up to it. It's called the bore. B O is it B O A R? B O no, it's B O R E. Yeah. Anyway, I, I, that's right. I, I want to make it B O A R. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I make it B O A R. So anyway, I named it the wild boar, B O A R, because that's what Pope Leo called Luther, that wild boar who is causing all this trouble. Of course, he means B O A R boar, right? And so I call his trombone the wild boar. I don't know if Nathaniel calls it that, but I like to call it the wild boar because in the first one was named Luther, and of course, that's another name for Luther, was the wild boar, which I'm sure was connected somehow to what I was reading, but I don't remember now how. But anyway. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Uh, so anyway, the wild boar was, was, was the name that Pope Leo had for Luther, which was not a kind thing, right? Um, um, this is insults back and forth. And if, for example, if you were to read, okay, you have to jump forward in history a little bit, so we're in 1521. In 15, the 1560s, Luther's dead by 1546. In the 1550s and 60s, somewhere in that range, the church, finally, the Roman Catholic Church, finally gets around to holding this big council, this big meeting that Luther had been asking for for years, which they never did, to talk about some of these things. And they finally do it after Luther's dead. I think that's probably on purpose. They didn't want Luther around because he was too much trouble. But anyway, Luther's dead by this point. And, they, and the document that comes out of this are called the Canons and Decrees of the Council of Trent. Well, if you read through the Canons and Decrees of the Council of Trent, which I don't know why you would unless you couldn't sleep, but anyway, if you did, you would discover these incredibly audacious statements. Things like, anyone who believes that he's saved by faith alone, let him go to hell. Statement after statement after statement, just like that. These are the official teachings of the Roman Catholic Church, still today. I mean, they've never recanted those. They've never taken those back. They're just still part of their official teachings. I'm not pointing fingers or trying to be mean or anything. I'm just saying, when people think that, that like, oh, we, why can't we all just worship together? Well, if you quit telling us we're going to hell for believing that we, by faith alone, we're saved, maybe we can make some progress. But so long as those documents stand, we have some trouble reconciling because time after time after time, it's like, well, we believe that, we believe that, we believe that, and these are all things they're saying, if you believe that, go to hell. So anyway, my point is, they didn't play nice. They didn't say nice things. So the fact that Luther called the Pope the Antichrist, and you should have seen the artwork. Ooh. Yeah. You talk about stuff that you wouldn't, like, don't look at that, son. Okay, so the, 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 the pictures and portrayals of the Pope as this seven-headed dragon and this, or a donkey, you know, and, you know, I mean, just, these were woodcuts, too, so they get stamped on everything. So, um... It's a real lively culture at this time. So anyway, so don't, don't view this from the perspective of 21st century America because you have to go into their context and see this was not some aberration on how they address each other. This was common. Okay, Luther's defiance resulted in his official excommunication on January 3rd, 1521. But due to his popular support and his unwillingness to recant his views, Luther represented a serious threat to the political and religious stability of the Holy Roman Empire. Therefore, the newly elected emperor, Charles V, summoned Luther to the imperial diet that was to be held in the German city of Worms. For those unfamiliar with the term, a diet was a meeting of the most significant political authorities in the Holy Roman Empire for the purpose of discussing and resolving key issues facing the realm. Although the Diet commenced on January 23rd, 1521, Luther did not arrive until April 16th. Now you have to understand, you, can't, you don't hop into your SUV, right? I mean, it, takes, it can take, depends on where it is in the empire. If you started traveling right away, it would take you weeks. So he doesn't start traveling right away, and these diets would go on for months. Pretty common. Because it takes so much flip and effort to get there, you're going to get everything figured out now, and you may not meet again for 10 more years. Because the travel is not like it is today. You're going to be on a cart with a horse at best. Right? You're not going to be driving your SUV or hopping in an airplane. Prior to his agreeing to appear at the Diet, Luther's Duke, Elector Frederick the Wise, sought and gained for Luther a promise of safe conduct. This was a big deal. It basically is a way of saying, all right, we won't kill you. Now, it didn't mean a lot because if you were, con if you were condemned as a heretic, that pretty much it was common for that to become null and void if you were condemned as a heretic. John Huss had 
the safe conduct promise, but he was condemned as a heretic, so well, it doesn't apply. It's kind of like this, oh, my fingers were crossed moment. So anyway, his elector, who is one of the electors who elects the Holy Roman Empire, he's one of the most powerful men in the empire, he has sided with Luther and is trying to protect this Luther because for political and religious reasons, Luther is important to him. So he does secure this safe conduct, and at least on paper they have that guaranteed. The granting of safe conduct meant that Luther could not be seized and put to death. Indeed, even with the promise of safe conduct, Luther was extremely trep trepidatious about appearing before the Diet. Roughly 100 years earlier, Jan Hus, the Czech proto-reformer, had been promised safe conduct at the Council of Constance by the Emperor Sigismund. That promise had not been honored, and Hus was seized and burned as a heretic, along with his companion, Jerome of Prague. Nevertheless, in spite of his fears, Luther obeyed the summons. On April 17th, Luther was called before the Diet for questioning. Johann Eck, a papal theologian, not to be confused with Luther's opponent on the same name at the Leipzig debate of 1518, that's another story, same name, different person, asked Luther if he was willing to renounce his errors and the works that he had published, he had published them in. Dr. Jerome Schruff, or Scherf, a professor of canon law and Luther's advocate, asked that the titles of his writings for which he was accused of heresy be read aloud. Of Luther's works, 25 titles were read off. After hearing this, Luther affirmed that they were indeed his writings. Regarding the question of whether or not he would renounce the errors he was accused of, the reformer answered that he would need a day in order to consider the matter and give a full answer. His request was granted. How would you sleep that night? I mean, if you recant, all is well. You, you can go about your life, no fear. If you don't, you're a dead man. You've kind of put yourself in Luther's shoes here, right? And like I said, it's not just him. There, there, there are whole political uh, things involved here with, with uh, the, the, the regions of Germany uh, who are adopting this Reformation. So you've got political pressure, you've got theological pressure you, from both sides. So it's really intense. On April 18th, 500 years ago today, Luther re reappeared before the Diet. He reported that before giving his answer that he had prayed for long hours, and I have no doubt Luther prayed for long hours. He could stay up all night praying. Right? It's not exaggeration for Luther. And had also consulted his friends and other counselors of high esteem. And giving his response to the question of recantation, the reformer noted that although, although all these so-called errant writings were his, they were not all the same kind. First, there were writings of devotional nature, many of which had been well received, even by his theological opponents. There would be no reason to renounce these writings. Secondly, there were writings where he had attacked specific ecclesiastical abuses. Luther noted that if he recanted these writings, he would do nothing but encourage error and tyranny. And you have to know, so ecclesiastical means church. Even Roman Catholics who didn't side with Luther acknowledged these abuses. If you read history... It's embarrassing stuff going on in the church. So when a priest was a, appointed as a priest of a congregation, he also got uh, the proceeds from the land that went with it. It was called a bishopric. And you were only supposed to have one bishopric. But you had many bishops with multiple bishoprics, which made them almost always the wealthiest person in town. So there's money involved. Uh, and this was one point that Luther was criticizing. And now follow me here. Some of these priests were leaving their bishoprics to their children. Now, yes. <laughs> Why would celibate priests have children? That's curious, isn't it? <laughs> um, so you have lots, lots. And then the way these priests would get these bishoprics well, we just call it a bribe, but they would pay enough. Right, this is all behind the whole um, indulgence thing back in 1517. Albert of Mainz paid enough money to the Pope by borrowing enough money from a rich German banker family to buy the next, next bishopric, and then he wants to sell these indulgences, and he's going to use part of the proceeds to pay back the guys he borrowed the money from to get the bishopric. Luther didn't like that so much. 
He said, it's just a bribe. You just paid enough money to get what the canon law says you shouldn't have. And now you're going to fleece the German people. Half of it's going to go build a basilica in Rome that we will never see. And half of it's going to go to pay back your rich German bankers. It's just, it's just slimy. Okay, so Luther said, I can't recant those because everybody knows these things are true. It's happening. Thirdly, there were a number of writings that he had directed against specific individuals. There, Luther admitted that his polemics, so a polemic would be, um, you might use the word attack, his criticism of, his polemic, were often very harsh, and for this, he was sorry. In other words, he said, I went too far in some of this in my personal attacks. Nevertheless, he stood by the substance of what had, he had written and therefore could not recant them either. In summation, Luther stated that his conscience was captive to God's word. Luther noted that it was impossible to rely on anything other than the Bible as the ultimate source of authority because the Roman Catholic Church had often contradicted itself in its official pronouncements. And if you read them, they did. Indeed, unless Eck or the other papal theologians could prove to him through the appealing to the Bible or sound reason that he was wrong, he would stand by everything that he had said. Now, according to some traditions, Luther added at the end, here I stand. Nevertheless, whether he genuinely spoke those words, here I stand, these words cannot be, they cannot be verified with certainty. In other words, um, whether that was simply added later or whether he said it in the first recording of what, not audio recording, but you know, on paper, it doesn't have that phrase. But the thing is, Luther was asked to give his statement in German and in Latin. So he gave it in Latin or first or German first, whatever. So maybe that one version is recorded and that lacks it, and they just didn't record the other one. You know, the records aren't all as neat and tidy as we wish. Anyway, Eck responded that all heretics appealed to Scripture and therefore it was necessary to rely on the institutional church's interpretation to gain clarity regarding the content of the faith. So Eck said basically, all heretics claim the Bible as their source. You need to rely upon the church. And Luther is saying, I can't rely upon the church because the church can err. God's word cannot. For this reason, argued Eck, by pitting his own interpretation against the teaching of the institutional church, Luther clearly proved himself to be a heretic and therefore should be condemned. In other words, what Rome says is true because Rome says it. Whether it's in the Bible or not, it doesn't matter. In fact, if you read the Roman Catholic Catechism, it's still there today. It will make very clear they have two sources of authority, the Bible and oral tradition, which has been handed from pope to pope to pope. Okay, so... They're very clear. They are not a scripture alone church. So nothing's changed there. As a result of Luther's failure to recant, private conferences among the various imperial authorities immediately broke out. Since the emperor insisted on not repeating the sin of Sigismund against Huss, executing him, burning him to the stake, it was impossible to seize and execute the reformer on the spot. This allowed Luther time to flee back to Wittenberg. In the meantime, the papacy officially pronounced Luther a heretic and made it a crime for anyone to possess his writings. So now we've upped the ante. If we find his writings in your possession, there will be penalty. Likewise, on May 26, 1521, Emperor Charles V issued the Edict of Worms, which declared Luther to be an outlaw and banned his teachings. As an outlaw, anyone who captured or killed him would be rewarded by the government authorities for doing a good work. So there's, you know, wanted, dead, or alive reward, right? It's like you see the Wild West movies where they got them on the telephone, the poles. That's what's going on here. On the way back to Wittenberg, Luther was captured, air quotes captured, because it was, the, the prince had staged this. I don't, know, I don't know if Luther knew or not, but anyway, he was captured by Frederick the Wise's soldiers posing as highwaymen, basically bandits. He was escorted to the Wartburg Castle in the heart of the Thuringian Forest. What a great word. Luther remained there in hiding for a little under a year. He used the time to translate the New Testament into German and write a number of theological treatises. Although Luther had initially believed that his condemnation at Worms was the end of his life in Reformation, it proved ultimately to be merely the end of the beginning. Okay, so Luther's in exile. He's been kidnapped. He's been squirreled away in this castle in Wartburg. Um, and so this is great. So not only is he translating the New Testament into German, which is going to really actually influence the German language still to this day. 
it was a, I mean, the, the, in, the influence of Luther's German translation of the Bible just can't be overstated, not only for Germany, but for all the world, because having the Bible in your own language, um, there were many who tried to translate the Bible into the local language who were burned at the stake, because the church had an official translation, the Latin Vulgate, and you were not allowed to do other translations. Why? Because, and there's one little element of truth in this, if you give any fool the Bible, they may do crazy things with it. And there's truth to that, right? So, yes. However, to keep the Bible out of the, the people's hands so they can't read it themselves, uh, Luther considered the risk worth it so they could have the scriptures themselves. Because most people in Germany didn't speak Latin. So they, had, they couldn't, there was no way they could not read the Bible. It was not in their language. They had to depend upon the priest. He would tell them what was in it. They couldn't read it themselves. So while Luther is there, um, he adopts a, a, a fake identity. He becomes Knight George. This is fantastic. And he grows out his beard, grows out his hair, because as a monk, he had a shaved head. Okay. So he grows out his beard. He becomes Knight George. And then, after 10 months, he sneaks back to Wittenberg. The prince doesn't know it. He sneaks back to Wittenberg to kind of see how things are going, how the reform is progressing. And most people, they don't know it's Luther because he's Knight George. He's dressed up like a knight. He has long hair. He's not the Luther they remember. You know, so it's this great scene where he sneaks back into Wittenberg and eventually then slides back into the classroom and starts teaching again at Wittenberg at the college, right? And so, um, but by this time, he's also protected by his elector in that region, and so um, he's not able to be touched, and he's a hero of the people, both theologically and politically, because some of the politics were, Rome is in what country? Italy. Wittenberg's in what country? Germany. And Rome, I'm gonna call it a tax, but basically you paid your taxes to Rome, and it went off to Italy, and almost, I mean, percentage, maybe 1% of Germany ever went to Italy. So they never got to see the capital, you know, to see the Vatican. And so they resented all the money leaving their country. And so Luther was this sort of fearless um, um, icon for them who had stood up to this giant and said no and lived to tell the story. So he was a huge a hero in that politically and uh, theologically. Now, the stories, if you just want to read some of this history, it's uh, over there somewhere are some of our Luther books. But anyway, um, the, the story is so fascinating, uh, it's worth reading because Luther doesn't always have a lot of love for these popular uprisings that try to commandeer him for their purpose because they try to do things that are contrary to Scripture and they're just using him as a political icon, and Luther doesn't want anything to do with that. It's not about politics for him. But understand politically, he was a very popular figure in much of Germany, and there was this new invention called printing the printing press. And the printing press spread Luther's documents everywhere. Right? So without the printing press, the Reformation probably doesn't happen. If you have to copy everything by hand, it probably doesn't happen. But the printing press was um, the Snapchat of their day. It, it was texting. I mean, it was, it was the instant form of communication that had never before in the history of the world been possible to mass produce these things. And so the printing press, Luther's works, I mean, they are all over the place. They're all over Germany and beyond. So his Reformation uh, can spread in a way that it couldn't have otherwise. Okay. Doing great. The fire hose is still going. You just keep drinking. Here's Luther's actual speech. See how far I get in it. I give you a flavor for Martin Luther. But remember the context, all right? Okay, most serene emperor, illustrious prince, princes, gracious lords. And this flowery language is so common. I mean, you just, you had to lay it on thick. Because the emperor could kill you, right? So... Whether Luther actually meant this or not, doesn't matter. These were the titles. I this day appear before you in all humility, according to your command, and I implore your majesty and your august highnesses 
by the mercies of God to listen with favor to the defense of a cause which I am well assured is just and right. Now, by the way, he's not supposed to be doing this. He's just supposed to say yes or no. That's all they want. Yes or no. (laughs) And you've got two pages, right? (laughs) I ask pardon if by reason of my ignorance I am wanting in the manners that befit a court. For I have not been brought up in king's palaces, but in the seclusion of a cloister. And I claim no other merit than that of having spoken and written with the simplicity of mind, which regards nothing but the glory of God and the pure instruction of the people of Christ. In other words, I I may not act right in your presence. You're you're high culture. I'm just this lowly monk. All right, of course, this is probably a little false humility on Luther's part, but, you know, he's laying it on thick. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Two questions were yesterday put to me by this, his imperial majesty. The first, whether I was the author of the books whose titles were read. The second, whether I wished to revoke or defend the doctrine I have taught. I answered the first directly, and I adhere to that answer, that these books are mine and published by me, except so far as they may have been altered or interpolated by the craft of officiousness of opponents. In other words, if someone changed it, I didn't change it. As for the second question, I am now about to reply to it. And I must first entreat you, your majesty and your highnesses to deign to consider that I have composed writings on very different subjects. In some I have discussed faith and good works in a spirit of once, in a spirit at once so pure, clear, and Christian that even my adversaries themselves, far from finding anything to censure, confess that these writings are profitable and deserve to be perused by devout persons. In other words, nobody objected to these. Why would I, why would I reject those? Okay. The Pope's bull, uh, that's just a great phrase, by the way, violent as it is, acknowledges this. So even the Pope's bull acknowledged that some of these writings were fine. What then should I be doing if I were now to retract these writings? Wretched man, I alone of all men living should be abandoning truths approved by the unanimous voice of friends and enemies and should be opposing doctrines that the whole world glories in confessing. Like, What kind of person would I be to reject these because everybody agrees these are good? I have composed, secondly, certain works against the papacy, wherein I have attacked such as by false doctrines, irregular lives, and scandalous examples afflict the Christian world and ruin the bodies and souls of men. And it is... And is not this confirmed by the grief of all who fear God? Is it not manifest that the laws and human doctrines of popes entangle, vex, and distress the consciences of the faithful, while the crying and endless exhortations of Rome engulf the property and wealth of Christendom, and more particularly of this illustrious nation? In other words, they're taking our money. They're fleecing us for all we're worth. They're extorting us, basically. Yet it is a perpetual statute that the laws and doctrines of the Pope be held erroneous and reprobate when they are contrary to the gospel and the opinions of the church fathers. So in other words, we should condemn those that are false. If I were to revoke what I have written on that subject, what should I do but strengthen this tyranny and open a wider door to so many and flagrant impieties, bearing down all resistance with fresh fury, We should behold these proud men swell, foam, and rage more than ever. And not merely would the yoke which now weighs down Christians be made more grinding by my retraction, it would thereby become, so to speak, lawful, for, by my retraction, it would receive confirmation from your most serene majesty and all the states of the empire. Great God, I should be thus to be like an infamous cloak used to hide and cover over every kind of malice and tyranny. In other words... These criticisms have been nearly universally acknowledged as valid. And if I recant them, I'm basically saying they're okay. Do you know at one point there were four popes simultaneously? Yeah, yeah, there was the fight over who was pope, and there were four men who claimed to be pope. Multiple times there were multiple popes fighting over who was pope. Yeah, I mean, the history is, is not this clean history that we all want to... And Luther is saying... We all know about this stuff. I mean, so I may put it in today's culture, and I'm trying to be very gentle here, but some of the sex scandals going on today, they're Boy Scout stuff compared to what was going on in Luther's day. Okay? That stuff was rampant. Just, and Luther says, everybody knows this. And everybody agrees it's, 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 it's a disgrace. It needs to be dealt with. So why would I recant that? I'm just going to be just saying it's okay. So that's what he says there. In the third and last place, 
have written some books against private individuals who had undertaken to defend the tyranny of Rome by destroying the faith. I freely confess that I may have attacked such persons with more violence than was consistent with my profession as an ecclesiastic. I do not think of myself as a saint, but neither can I retract these books, because I should, by so doing, sanction the impieties of my opponents, and they would thence take occasion to crush God's people with still more cruelty. Yeah. As I am a mere man, and not God, I will defend myself after the example of Jesus Christ, who said, If I have spoken evil, bear witness against me. But well, but if well, why dost thou strike me? From John chapter 28. How much more should I, who am but dust and ashes, and so prone to error, desire that every one should bring forward what he can against my doctrine? Therefore, most serene emperor, and your illustrious princes, and all, whether high or low, who hear me, I implore you by the mercies of God to prove to me by the writings of the prophets and apostles that I am in error. As soon as I shall be convinced, I will instantly retract all my errors, and will myself be the first to seize my writings and commit them to the flames. What I have just said will, I think, clearly show that I have well considered and weighed not only the dangers to which I am exposing myself, but also the parties and dissensions excited in the world by means of my doctrine, of which I was yesterday so gravely admonished. But far from being dismayed by them, I rejoice exceedingly to see the gospel this day, as of old, a cause of disturbance and disagreement. For such is the character and destiny of God's word. I came not to send peace on the earth, but a sword, said Jesus Christ. For I am come to set a man at variance with against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be those of his own household. God is wonderful and terrible in his counsels. Let us have a care. Let, uh, lest in our endeavors to arrest discords, we be bound to fight against the holy word of God and bring down upon our heads a frightful deluge of inextricable dangers, present disaster, and everlasting desolations. Let us have a care that the reign of the young and noble prince, remember he's 21 years old, the emperor Charles, on whom, next to God, we build so many hopes, should not only commence, but continue to terminate its course under the most favorable auspices. I might cite examples drawn from the oracles of God. I might speak of pharaohs and of kings of Babylon or of Israel who were never more contributing to their own ruin than when by measures and appearances most prudent they thought to establish their authority. God removeth the mountains and they know not. In other words, we can't set up some artificial structure or some artificial hierarchy as authority. And every time they did this in scripture, it was disaster. In speaking thus, I do not suppose that such noble princes have need of my poor judgment, for I wish to equip myself of a duty whose fulfillment my native Germany has a right to expect from her children. And so, commending myself to your august majesty and your most serene highnesses, I beseech you in all humility not to permit the hatred of my enemies to rain upon me an indignation I have not deserved. I have done. In other words, I'm finished so far. And then uh, he, he spoke this. Since your most serene majesty and your, most, your, your high mightinesses require of me a simple, clear, and direct answer, I will give one, and it is this. I cannot submit my faith either to the Pope or to the Council, because it is as clear as noonday that they have fallen to error and even in glaring cons inconsistency with themselves. If then I am not convinced by proof from the Holy Scripture or by cogent reasons, if I am not satisfied by this very text I have cited, and if my judgment is not in this way brought into subjection to God's word, I neither can nor will retract anything. For it cannot be either safe or honest for a Christian to speak against his conscience. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. God help me. Amen. Whoa. And that dis puts the Reformation into overdrive. Just instantly slams it, you know, from first or second. Boom, we're in fifth. We are going now. Pretty powerful stuff, isn't it? Okay. Whew. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts in the last three minutes. He didn't end up getting killed. No, he didn't. He lived, he died a natural death. Um, but no, he did not end up being killed. Uh, and that was because at least this Pope had enough goodness to honor his safe conduct promise. The Pope before him did not, and that's why Johann Huss was murdered, well, at least a couple of Popes before, because it's been 100 years before. But anyway, um, yeah, he honored that safe conduct. But um, yeah, just... He did get married to a former nun. Yeah, 
And the story of how they smuggled them out of the convent was remarkable. It was in a fish barrel, wasn't it? Yeah, they took them out in barrels. Took them out in barrels on carts? Yeah. And it's great because the story with that with, with Catherine von Bora, he was working to find sp husbands for all these nuns, right? And uh, he couldn't find one for her, and she was pretty set on having him as a husband. And he finally gave in to her, <laughs> and then making her, taking her as a wife. So she was an interesting character. We, we were on a tour 21 years ago. Yeah. We was there at their house. Oh, neat. And everything. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Catherine von Bora was a fascinating lady. And you read there's some, we have a book here somewhere on, on Catherine von Bora. I'm not sure where it is. But anyway, she's a fascinating character too. Because the Reformation principles caught hold and you had nuns leaving the convent. Because they finally realized that going to the convent wasn't a sure way to get to heaven. Because that was the whole point is you could basically by doing good works, it, it would uh, improve your chances of salvation by being in the convent. Well, when you realize it was by Christ alone, the convents suddenly were being emptied. And you had all these women with no husbands. And at that time, you know, single women needed husbands. I mean, not that they had to have them, but it was not common to be a, a, a single woman making your way in the world. So husbands needed to be found. They were rounded up. And then all kinds of marriages are taking place. It is remarkable. So, um, so much more to share from the Reformation time, but this just gives you a little snapshot into what happened 500 years ago today. And it continues to impact you today. History is still relevant. So, uh, anyway, any other th final thoughts in my last 30 seconds? <sighs> yeah, yeah, they do. I, I don't know if it's quite as public as an event, though, today. Yeah, not quite the same kind of flair to it. <laughs> yeah. All right, everybody, thank you for your patience and hope you appreciate um, the Reformation that much more. <laughs>